start. Did anybody have any questions on the first half? Any questions on the bridge from the first half of the <coughs> session? Okay. Yeah. Now this is wonder how much that phone costs. XP cell. How much did it cost? <laughs> you know what? I think they're. Um, I think it's like what a couple hundred or is it? No, I think it's comparable to your uh, iPhone six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars. Okay. I mean, I really don't think. But there's no charge or subsidy. <laughs> that's yeah, true. Yeah. There isn't. And actually, that's feedback we gave to FirstNet was that um, carrier subsidized people adopting LTE devices, and FirstNet needs to consider that, especially if they want to deploy to rural areas and actually get agencies to use them. You know, they won't see the value unless potentially it's subsidized. So whether they do that is a whole different story. But we've we've told them that we know other states have too. The cost is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. We used to have a, a larger section on. On what's going to uh, make FirstNet uh, more attractive, ultimately to come down to cost. If you if you have uh, your users who, and you're using a commercial network now, you're paying 50, 60 bucks a month, and then, uh, you know the national network gets built out and it costs 120 bucks a month. That's a significant difference, especially with budget constraints. Uh, so I, I think they've heard that loud and clear that, that the cost of the device and the cost of service has to be comparable to, to what you have now. Now in the end, who knows what's going to happen, but, but that has uh, been delivered loud and clear. Yeah, it's almost going to have to be subsidized because I think we, we saw price resistance around once you get up to $40, $50 a month on average, a lot of the people that responded to the survey were like, yeah, and I, when I was in Idaho, one of the rural counties, they, they told me, you know, anything over $30 a month, forget it. We can't even consider doing that. Um, because there's a trade-off of, okay, I, I have my commercial service now. No, I don't have priority access. No, it's not resilient, but it's giving me what I need now. So to make that jump and to pay that extra to get the priority service and make it mission critical, you know, it's, it's ultimately a financial <coughs> decision. It's, it's a nice to have, but it's yeah. a financial Yeah, the selling decision. point's going to have to be, Similar cost, but now I got preemption. Now I've got my own uh, dedicated resource. So, yeah, because I mean, the, the a lot of the eastern states are probably going to be subsidizing the western states, and the urban areas are going to be subsidizing the rural. I mean, that's the way they have to get all these devices and number of users in for the RFP is to try to see, you know, how many are we dealing with overall to kind of set a, gen, a general price. So. Well, FirstNet has said uh, <coughs> at meetings with states that there are really only five to seven states that actually make money and ultimately end up subsidizing the rest of the states. Yeah. Um, in theory, according to them, without the ability to sell the spectrum dynamically, which I'll let you kind of explain a little bit more, um, it would not be um, a money-making proposition for them to deploy in most of the country. Yeah. So. Okay, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about user equipment. Um, what what sort of uh, user equipment do you do you see that you have a desire to be able to put on this network? Is it smartphones, laptops, modems, all of the above? In the future, you know, robotics for search and rescue, drones, um, sensors. So, you know, one of the big one of the big issues is uh, going to be getting the band class uh, fourteen into the chipsets into the types of devices that public safety is going to be using. So. Uh, one of the examples is this uh, Sonom XP7, uh, which they recently put in band class 14. In fact, uh, Kim brought, this is the 7700 from Adams County here, so here's an example of it. But there's not a whole lot of devices right now that have band class 14. I've talked to Qualcomm and some of the chipset manufacturers, you know, they, they can put obviously band class 14 in, but, you know, there's got to be a uh, desire to, uh, and, and a user base to support uh, putting those into the devices. So that's going to be one of the challenges of the national public safety broadband network is getting band class 14 into into the lot of the devices that, that public safety is going to be using. So we've got some examples here, a vehicle modem, uh, Sonom XP7 I just said, uh, this Lex 700, um, and this Max phone, which is interesting, it's a P25 sleeve on an Android smartphone. We were talking a little bit about LMR and LTE integration. You know, there's a lot of companies that are looking at gateways and application servers to tie these networks together. And they're also looking at different devices 
to try to get both P25 and, uh, and, and wireless broadband uh, capability on one device. Uh, so in the future, so, you know, there's all this quote that goes around about 50 billion connections to the Internet by 2020. And the CEO of Ericsson has said it, and, and Cisco uses it, and this Internet of Things and machine to machine. You know, we know in the future that a lot of these um, even vending machines, uh, home appliances, sensors, everything that uh, has data or wants to send data uh, has, that has a chipset in it, you know, will most likely have an LTE chipset in it eventually. In fact, one of the major commercial carriers only keeps GSM around simply because they use it a lot for machine to machine like vending machine and, and, and texting because the chipset costs are very low. Uh, once LTE, the ecosystem continues to grow and the chipset costs fall, you know, we anticipate LTE chipsets being in many different things and in that whole uh, ecosystem of the Internet of Things. And obviously, we, uh, in, in a lot of these, you would want band class 14 and for sensors, um, for, uh, for future uh, search and rescue, robotics, uh, drones. So anything you wanted to add about the user equipment? Or is this, I mean, is there any user equipment that you see you need in your mission space in the, now or in the future that you don't see listed here? Is it mostly you know, the laptops, smartphones, vehicle modems? It would be the laptops. Yeah. But there's not that many laptops in the Right. Do most of the consoles is they are you talking about like in in, uh, in, in the vehicles or in the uh, in the PSAP or yeah so the question the question is about consoles uh, any any upgrade to consoles with uh, with band class fourteen but the consoles now um, they don't have any real wireless requirement right are they kind of like an IP connection so they're kind of like just basically as like a monitor or are they are they actually need right right that's what I figured yeah they have to be converted to IP but um, you know not necessarily a band class 14 chip to do specifically wireless or, or do you see a, a need for that oh, okay Oh, right, I see. Yeah, I mean, I would assume that there would be, uh, you know, an Eno B or something at the uh, at the PSAP, or it would be integrated into the uh, the, uh, the radio access network, and then there would be, you know, block wiring from there going into the, uh, through switches or some kind of gateway into the, into the consoles. But, you know, the, I mean, you know, at LTE, I mean, chipsets, I mean, they could be going in flat screen TVs. I mean, there's talk of, um, you know, Wi-Fi, uh, a, a lot of the, the ISN band, the uh, the kind of unlicensed band in Wi-Fi, there's actually talk about putting LTE on some of those unlicensed bands as well, like LTE, LTEU, unlicensed or LTE license uh, assisted access. So, you know, if LTE starts being put on some of the unlicensed frequency bands, which obviously I wouldn't recommend that for public safety, <coughs> but, uh, you know, there, there may be, uh, you know, moving forward consoles, flat screen TVs, monitors that actually may have LTE chips that's put them in as well. And we could be to the point, like you're saying, where you know you might be able to have a console in the dispatch area where you've got an LTE chipset that's actually talking wireless to the uh, eNode B. It would be like another UE on the network that could talk directly through an eNode B to, a, uh, to an officer in the field. So I'm not really aware of that. I mean, I'm not saying.
Yeah, I would think so. I mean, right. Or, or even if you had like an indoor repeater. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, there could be. I, I personally haven't seen this, and I'm not. I'm not saying it's not happening. Maybe it is, but you know, you could have a femto cell or home V that's connected to consoles and a dispatch, and they would be directly connected to that E node B, and uh, they could be directly communicating with an officer in the field off another E node B. I don't know why you, yeah, why you couldn't do that. So, I mean, if there's a use case for that, you know, I'm sure someone will build the equipment for it. Everybody wants another screen so they get to be separate. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, uh, anything else on user equipment or uh, yeah, the, the real key here is getting the band class 14 into the chipsets that go into these devices. And that is additional feedback we've given to FirstNet is they really need to look at um, uh, you know having those relationships with all of the device manufacturers and the chipset manufacturers and that um, if Band 14 is eventually in every device that's ever manufactured, and then it's a matter of access and identity management, and that's how potentially you solve your ability for volunteers um, and non-agency issued devices to be deployed, and people can still choose what they want from a consumer perspective. Again, who knows what's going to, what that, how that will turn out, but that has been feedback given to first But if the characters are looking at mixing, they have to, they have to have the band 14. Correct. Right, and that's that. That's a real key thing. Is if, if if the carrier is involved in the network, the carriers are good allies to have to lean on the device manufacturers because they can then take that band class fourteen request in with the request they have for all their other stuff and just make it part of you know their normal uh, uh, when they renegotiate their contracts with the device manufacturers. So that would that would be great about having either content providers. Or you know, like uh, companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft, or carriers that have that leverage to push back on the device manufacturers because they have a lot of other stuff they ask them for aside from just getting band class 14 in the chipsets. Okay, uh, these are some of the applications. This isn't meant to be incredibly exhaustive, but the but the point it's trying to make is that you know here's your very low latency and very high throughput applications like your interactive real time video. Uh, maybe gaming is not so uh, applicable, uh, but you could have machine to machine with robots sending video back, which could be real time. And then you've got your very, uh, you know, uh, not as low latency you can take a bit more latency, lower bandwidth like texting, SMS, and your kind. And then FTPs can go the whole gamut. But you know, this goes to show you the different types of applications. But these are the ones here that can really stress the LTE network and take up a lot of a uh, lot of over the air capacity. And I put a couple quotes in here. One is. You know, uh, Verizon made this, well, it's been a couple years now back in April, but, you know, they said 50% of their uh, wireless uh, net network traffic is video, and by 2017, they think it's going to be two-thirds. So the public's definitely moving everything towards video. So even if you, if you have a traffic model now and you think you know what your users are doing, you know, just keep this kind of stuff in mind because they may just be doing this down here. But once they have the broadband pipes open, they may want to look at start using video more, maybe doing real-time streaming with body-worn cameras. Um, so whatever your traffic profile is now, I suspect it's going to change once this network becomes available. So it's really important to keep in mind with your users, you know, what do they really see themselves doing in the future? What? Where is NG911 in Colorado? How, how far along are you in the process? I'll let you guys answer that question. <laughs> it's kind of up to each PSAP or region of PSAPs, but the board is probably in any state. Well, I, I don't want to say state agency because the agency is really the one state involved. I don't know if that's something great law. It's going gonna, it's gonna to put a lot of demands on the broadband side of things, at least on the throughput side of things, how much bandwidth you have. Um, we're already starting to see in the field where you know, these jurisdictions that have uh, you know, lots of partners in public safety, they want to stream their security camera videos with PSAP or stream it someplace, and that's only going to increase, at least the, the request to do that is going to increase. And as, you know, when this first step comes online, now you have an avenue to do that. You have to make decisions on, okay, we can't handle that much video traffic at one time. Uh, and then yeah, or, or don't give them devices with band class 14 to right, stay right. off here. Uh, <laughs> or you have off 
officers and the demands from the citizens to say, well, we want we want to see that real time body or camera video. We would love to do it. We can't we can't do it because uh, of the network. But those demands are going to you're going to start seeing those pop up. And I just wanted to see on the NG nine on one side because those are those conversations are happening. You, know, you have fusion centers that are have all the streaming, have the TVs everywhere. And, Everybody wants real-time information, real-time video, and those those requests will start popping up, and it's going to take a really savvy uh, manager who says, "No, we can't do that." But it would be nice to be able to pass like a bank robbery, or we had a call this morning to one of the came that had a lot of video camera. I was stabbing suspect to be able to follow that car, you know, right? The officers to be able to see where it's at, yeah, but yeah. only on certain requests, or right? Yeah. And, and that's a decision. If this gets priority, this is this is priority access on the network. And everybody else hold off on your for streaming video or pushing this up. So uh, <clears throat> another quote I have here is uh, Motorola did a nice study. I like this paper where they took a, a couple of different screen sizes, UEs, and they did HD video and they said, you know, at least one megabit, uh, you would need at least one megabit per second. So when we do the RF design, uh, uh, we show you the coverage plots and capacity plots we later on. I'm kind of assuming three meg at the cell edge, so I'm assuming three kind of simultaneous video users, worst case scenario at the edge of the cell. Um, now, that, now there are, you know, we talk about stream, if you stream like that, we were talking about streaming a, a body-worn camera, you know, if it's going at 2.2 gigabytes per hour, you know, it's five megabits per second. Um, I don't know if you saw this at the PSCR conference, but DHS Science and Technology is working with MIT, and they're actually trying to come up with like a smart belt buckle that will somehow analyze the video that's being recorded and try to just capture certain stills or save it and compress it. And so you, if you're in an area with low coverage or low bandwidth, and it'll just send clips from the video, but you know the intelligence of some belt buckle being able to do the what, what an officer can determine what's the important part of the video, I don't know about that. But there is, it is a problem that you know the carriers, um, government realizes that you know with, with body-worn cameras and wanting to stream real time, and even with an LTE network, um, you know, they're trying to look at ways to kind of minimize the impact with video compression techniques and kind of artificial intelligence so it doesn't tax the network. Um, and the other issue, too, I, this came up in Kansas when I was talking about it, and they said, well, you know, we really can't compress and slow down the video so much because sometimes the video gets taken into court and they'll say, well, it's been modified somehow. So there's another issue with the body-worn cameras. Of, you know, if you redact it or you change it, what's what's admissible in court? I don't know if you – have you seen any of that yet, or has that been an issue, or – when we, we do all our uploads, keep for 60 days, purge the old, but some get the non evidence, they right? Yeah, yeah. And then they highlight them, save them, record, right. can't touch them. Right. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the funny thing is about to get off on body worn cameras, but the body worn cameras themselves are expensive, but then it's really the network you need, the trailer, uh, Sean was saying, the training you need. You know, because it, and even the data storage, even if you go to some, so like evidence.com or something, you're storing it up there, you know, it's also the data transfer. Because how many, like, if it does become evidence, you know, how many times do you have to send these, these, these cases and these files, you know, the district attorney's office? I mean, how many times are going back and forth before we even get to trial? Um, so anyways. Um, okay, so we're going to talk, so, you know, when we were talking about the capacity and we were kind of treating all the users as equal on that slide with the LTE coverage, but the, the public safety LTE network is going to get a lot of uh, priority QoS and preemption capability that you don't get on the commercial network right now. I won't go into a lot of details of it, but one of the key important ones is called access class bar. And with your phone number now, public users have access classes assigned 0 to 9. And it used to be the last digit of your phone number, but with number portability, that's changed. Now it's really the decimal representation of the last number of your international mobile subscriber identity or your, your MZ. And that's what the public gets. Uh, access class 10 is for emergency calls. 11 and 15 is for people that work for the network operators. And they will use this access class because what they can do is they can take the a new base station they're putting up. If they don't want the public to jump on it right away because it hasn't been integrated into the network, they'll basically tell the base station to bar anyone from asking the base station to do anything unless they have an access class of 11 or 15 so they can work on it. And then 12 through 14 are really for uh, you know, emergency services, police, utilities. Uh, one of the projects I work on, we mentioned wireless priority service before. National security and emergency preparedness personnel all the way up to the president. They've already been assigned access class 14. 
So the important thing about having an access class that's between 10 and 15 is that when the base station gets congested, when it starts getting too many requests and too many users wanting to set up data bearers, it looks at its utilization on its control channels and it says, okay, wait a minute, or its signaling channels, I'm getting too many requests, I've got to start throttling people out in time. So what it does is it starts barring people from being able to immediately access the network and ask for something. Now, if you have an access class, which you'll probably end up with 12 or 13 on the, on the public safety uh, broadband network, you'll be exempt from that process. So if, as soon as you hit the send button to do a call or you want to set up a data bearer, you'll be able to try to ask for a resource on the, on the cell site immediately, whereas the public will be not, not completely barred, but they'll have to go through something called a persistence test, which kind of pushes them out in time and doesn't let, let, let them necessarily access the network immediately, or all of them access the network immediately. However, if someone does a 911 call, uh, the user device will see that it's a 911 call and it'll shift that to an access class 10 and they will be exempt as well. So in terms of dealing with the access classes of 10 for emergency and uh, 11 through 15, you know, carriers can set up different parameters of, of when they want to bar 911 or not. So there is technology there to do it. It just depends on, you know, what's the agreement, whether they want to let 911 calls through all the time, which usually they do. Uh, but but someone not a public user not dialing a 911 call will be barred from initially immediately accessing that cell site so that the signaling channels don't get congested. And so, you know, what that means operationally to you is that if you're at a cell site, say there's a bomb goes off or something and the cell site's congested, uh, you'll be able to attempt to access a resource to talk to the base station uh, immediately. You'll be exempt from that process, which is kind of pushing the general public out. And it, carriers need to do this anyways when the cell site gets congested, because if everyone tries to talk to the cell site at once, it's on a channel that's like a, it's like Wi-Fi. It's like a contention-based access channel. If everyone tries to talk at one time, it's just nonsense, and no one ever gets through to the base station on the channel that you're actually requesting to do something. So Rob, is this what they'll use? Let's say they want a, co a commander has a higher priority to access the network than uh, a first responder in the field. Are they able to give that barring to the well? That, so so this commander? this initial gating is pretty much going to treat most most people the same if you've got an access class over ten. So there's a couple priority. So you've got to look at the whole process of like setting up a data bear. So you basically go on a signaling channel and you say, I want to do something. The base station has to hear you and says, okay, I heard you. You want to do something. You and a couple of other people want to do something. I'm letting you have access to this resource to tell me what you want, want to do. Oh, you want to do this. Okay, then it starts actually setting up the data bear or kind of the traffic channel for you. So there's a, there's a couple of steps we'll talk about. But this is the initial step is basically let's first responders to start talking to the network uh, ahead, of, ahead, of, uh, ahead of the public. Now, what happens is... This, this random access, this is a random access channel, it's a physical random access channel. What happens is, if you're 12 through 14 and you're exempt from this access class barring, you're allowed to go ask the base station something. Then it sends you back a request, but there's some contention here. You, you're, all these people with these access classes are contending with one another, right? And, and I should put uh, uh, 10 on there as well. If you're, if you're a first responder, you this thing called an establishment clause, which is basically what do you want to do if you're sent to one of these access classes, you'll be given what's called a high priority access. So you'll be able to win contention with other users. Now, let me make one thing clear. Even when access class barring is happening, it doesn't mean that no public users can get through right away. Some will be able to get through. And what it does is it kind of lowers the gate of how many people it lets through depending on the congestion that it's seeing. So let's say some public users got through and they want to do a mobile originating access. They want to make a mobile call. Well, they'll go and they'll fight for contention to get on this resource to get to the network to try to get their mobile call through. But because the public, uh, the emergency uh, first responders have high priority access, they'll win that contention against one of the public users. So they'll not only get through to ask something to the base station, but the base station will say, okay, I heard you, your connection request. Now I'm going to go up into the network, find out who you are, and, uh, and, and try to process your request. So, the, so these are kind of the initial signaling steps to talk to the network to try to do something. Does that make sense? Can talk about, just for the benefit of everybody, yeah. because this helped me when I listened previously, how this is done at the millisecond level as oh, well. Right, right, because right yeah. now in LMR conversations, you know, someone talks, it takes up the whole channel, and that's all that's occurring on the channel. So. Yeah, so, the, so, the, um, so this is all 
happening yeah, in, in, in milliseconds. It's, it's, it's very, very, very quick. Um, and when you, and when I talk about the coverage, I think I'll talk about the time okay. transmission interval of one, uh, right. one, one millisecond. But yeah, this is very, very quick that this is happening. And this channel here is not something where the base station sets it up for you. It's basically a random channel that people are kind of trying to get on, like on the time slot to get a, to get a slot on that channel to go ask the network to do something. So what happens next is once you get to the base station and, you, and the base station has heard you and it knows you want to do something, it's got to assign you a resource. So what it does is it sets up this data bearer from your UE all the way. Now this is, this is what's called a packet gateway and this is what connects you to an external network, let's say to the internet. So, but you've got to be able to set up this bearer. So there's one thing that's called, it's an allocation and retention priority parameter. And there, and there's, uh, and there's 1 to 15, and 1 is the highest. And what happens with this is if, is if you have a very high allocation retention priority, like 1 or 2 or 3, that means that you get preference. So let's say lots of people are getting into this. Like Kim was saying, the signaling channel is very quick. It's like milliseconds. So a lot of people are getting on it. Some people are getting through the base station. But the base station says, OK, I've only got so many resources for traffic. You used up my signaling resource, but the traffic resource is different. Now, who am I going to give this traffic resource to? I say I'm completely congested, and I've got one data bearer left. Well, if a public user gets through at the same time as a public safety user gets through, the public safety user is going to have a higher allocation and retention priority. And so they're going to get a higher preference to get that data bearer, to get that traffic resource over the public. Now, there's another parameter attached to this, which is a preemption vulnerability. So if you're a, if you're a public safety responder, you get a higher value, but you also have your preemption vulnerability set to no. So if you have a data bearer set up, the public can't take it away from you. They can't preempt you, but you can preempt the public. So the two things that public safety will have is a higher ARP level, and they also have the ability to preempt. So say there's a couple of data bearers that are left at the cell site. It's not completely exhausted. A public safety user comes in, a, uh, a, a normal commercial public user comes in, the public safety person is going to get that bear. Okay. But what if all the bears are taken? Like there's no more bears available. There's no more, I'll call them traffic channels to take. The public safety user comes in, they can preempt. They can take away a bearer from a commercial user. Now, for the public safety network, you're gonna have band class 14, you're gonna have your own, you're gonna have that preemption capability. Now that capability when you roam onto another network is still up in question for FirstNet to negotiate because a lot of the commercial carriers you know, they have these default bears that, that, they, that they set up, which gives people their IP address. And then they have these guaranteed bit rate bears, which are like for voice calls. They're a little concerned if a public safety user roams onto, let's say, a non-band class 14 site, like your normal Verizon or AT&T site, and it's congested, and they're, taking, and they're knocking people, uh, commercial users, off their, off their uh, Volte calls. Uh, so the key to remember here is your band class 14 sites, which are your public safety sites, you'll be able to have this preemption capability to knock public users off, but you may not have it when you roam onto a commercial network. That's going to be something that FirstNet's going to have to arrange with, with their roaming partners. Okay, so you set up the day. So the first thing you do is you set up a default bearer. Okay, that's basically attaching you to the network. The packet gateway gives you your IP address so you can go talk to external uh, networks like the internet, your external packet data networks if you're trying to FTP data from a server or something. And then it sets up additional bears for each application you launch. And you can launch up to about eight bears. So you can do video, you can do text, you can do multiple bears at the same time. But each of those bears, once that bear is set up, you're going to be doing applications on those bears. So the other important thing is, is the what they call the QoS class identifier. And what this is used at is at every single node along the way, in this data bear context, going to where you're to, to here, it's going to try to prioritize your packets over other packets, and it's based on application. I put a reference here in the three GPP standards, but what this does is shows you different QCI values for what we call guaranteed bitrate bears, which are kind of the more important bears, and the non-guaranteed bitrate bears, and it controls what the priority level is of your packets, also what the delay you're allowed to experience and the packet loss you're allowed to experience. Now, obviously, higher QCI values go to stuff like this IMS signaling. That's a signaling related to Volte and voice calls and LTE. The next highest priority level two, you see it's for conversational voice. So 
These are just recommended standards, but carriers can set these values to whatever they want. But you can imagine if you're a carrier, what are you going to give the highest QCI values? How are you going to prioritize packets and ensure that they're low delay and that they get forwarded through each, each node in the network? You're going to do that for stuff like voice, for like real-time video. You're not going to necessarily do it for like internet browsing. So in the standards, they've already put in uh, some of these priorities, which are even below one, which is like to see this 0.5 here. And this is for mission-critical push-to-talk signaling and for actually the mission-critical push-to-talk traffic. So if you're a public safety user, you've got a higher access class, you get through to talk to the base station first above the public, you get to win the contention to actually request something with that establishment clause at the high priority access. You also get your data bearer set up because you have a higher priority for that, and you can preempt public data bearers on a band class 14 site to take their data bearer. And then also, once you have that, those bearers set up and you start running applications, the packets related to your applications can be prioritized. We see here mission critical push to talk uh, and, and bullet. Now, the key here is going to be when you're on a commercial network and they have a QCI value of two for their conversational voice, you know, you may be at the same QCI level as, as a public user, but the important thing is remember, you've got that ARP value, so you're allowed to set up the bearer. And if it's a band class 14 site, you will be able to kick public users off of the. Uh, the cell site and, and be able to set up bearers because the band class 14, the difference between those sites versus commercial ones, which will be the sites that make up your network is that you're what during the normal business day, you can have other users on it because they're going to try to value. You, you understand like first net, one of their business cases to try to evaluate the spectrum. So they need to get other users besides public safety on the spectrum, but those users could be using it. But once an emergency happens, public safety is going to get the priority and they can take all the bearers at that, at that site if they need to. So is this, is this clear that, you know, even though capacity has to be shared among users, as a public safety user, you have a lot of priority QoS and preemption mechanisms in LTE that aren't available in other wireless technologies. So you're going to be prioritized, you're going to have a preemption capability, and when you're running your applications, especially mission critical push to talk, you can see there's very high QCI values. Those applications will go ahead of other applications uh, within the radio access and core network. Does that make sense? or? Yeah, Dan. It is access class being implemented by commercial LTE carriers now? Yes, how they, they have. They, a, how do they determine that access? When you when you subscribe, uh, well, so when you subscribe, they're, they're, they they assign it in the HSS, and it, and your access class will be sent to you over the air if it's different than <coughs> zero to nine. So if, if say a commercial carrier, they could have an enterprise agreement with say a a, a, a group of police. And they could say, okay, we're going to give you access class 12 and 13 so that if there's congestion at a cell site, you'll get priority to talk to that site. You'll be exempt from that mechanism that's pushing out public users. So access class barring, establishment clause, all of this stuff is already in the LTE networks now. But the key here is that specifically with access class barring, in order to determine what level of utilization you start barring users and to try to optimize those parameters and to make sure that the access class barring is dynamic and automatic, uh, a lot of those algorithms are, are going to have to be uh, optimized for, for public safety. So the project, we, uh, you know, you know very well, I work on wireless priority service. You know, we work with the carriers to optimize a lot of these algorithms because uh, we will be having prioritized um, uh, wireless party service on Bolte coming out in a couple of years. So they'll be optimizing some of these algorithms for us and FirstNet will be doing the same thing with that. A lot of the stuff that I'm doing in wireless party service, FirstNet's doing the same thing with these priority mechanisms. So the mechanisms are in the networks now, but they're not necessarily using them right now uh, to allow public safety and bar public users. What they're really using the access class for right now is what I was saying earlier. Uh, for access classes 11 and 15 to kind of shut a new site off from the network until they've optimized it and integrated it and they can start letting letting the public on. But the mechanisms are there in the network. Okay. But some of the so algorithms have to be optimized. I'm, I'm going to be trading this black area in for a bank it's a couple of things. It happens to be Verizon. Mm -hmm. It's a DHS phone. Which what access class can I so you're going to have wireless party service on there, then you'll get 14. Cool. Yeah.
But you know, but the carrier has to have some agreement with you to know who you are, right? Like if you just walk into a store and you're you're a police officer and you buy a phone at Verizon, they're not they're going to give they're not going to give it to you unless you know you have some kind of arrangement with them, or you sign up for wireless priority service when it, or you know you 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 are it, certainly when you're on the network, the person that's going to be providing they're going to know who you are, and when they and when you subscribe to the service, you're going to get an access class. I'd imagine twelve or thirteen, and and you'll also be getting. Um, you know, high level arcs, you know, one, two, three, or four, something like that. And that'll all be in uh, your uh, your subscriber database with whichever carriers uh, FirstNet partners with. Are yeah. there any examples where they use this, like a use case for them, like an invest where the wireless company has actually allocated it to a certain entity for cleanup or for best recovery? Um, you know, I mean, we, we use it in wireless party service now on CDMA, on 3G and, and UMTS, they use this. Um, but aside from us doing it, unless the kid, see the problem with some of the access class barring techniques, especially in previous technology, like I said, right now, the only thing I'm aware of in LTE is if you have wireless priority service and they know you're, you know, a national security emergency preparedness person, they may set your access class higher if you have a contract with them. Uh, but you know, right now, what do they really do with it? The problem with a lot of access class barring techniques is they need to be automatic and dynamic. If it's not automatic and dynamic and it's, it's real, so an, an event happens, right? The surge just happens within, within seconds. It starts building. If the access class barring mechanism at the cell site has to wait for someone in the network operations center to say, okay, turn it on there, it's too late. The site's already going to be falling over. Some of them I know they have it set so that it will turn on to kind of bar so that the cell site kind of doesn't fall over or get so congested. I mean, you, we saw in the Virginia earthquake, I'm sure you have examples out here, you know, you went to make a call and it was, you couldn't get through at all. Um, but usually it's got to be under some kind of a, a contract or agreement. Um, but the technology's there. I mean, it, it, it's there in the networks. I mean, ARPs, QCIs, all this stuff is in the standards. Exactly how you optimize these algorithms for you know, first responders and all that, you know, some of that still has to be, has to be done. You know, what, you know, how much utilization on a signaling channel before you turn it on initially, 65%, 75%, 80%, 90%, you know, those kind of things, because, you know, these things are going to affect the public, so they have to know, you know, what's a good, you know, when can we wait to the point where we absolutely have to do it so we don't have to start barring, you know, the public needlessly, right, so... Because, you know, something could be just a high, high call surge and not necessarily, you know, an, uh, an emergency event, so. <clears throat> okay. Um, so since we're starting to run it, is there, is there any interest in going over some of the provisioning and kind of security things to keep in mind with the network? Um, I mean, this is, this is uh, you know, like Sean was talking about earlier, if you lose a device, you need to have procedures in place for remotely wiping it. Uh, you know, and making sure it gets locked so that someone can't take, especially if there's, you know, critical information on it. I mean, managing the applications and services on the devices, you know, who gets who gets what. I don't know if you guys are looking at, you know, there'll be, there'll be an application store with FirstNet, but then, you know, there's going to have to be some kind of local management of who can download what applications and, um, you know, who gets what applications, that, that sort of thing. Um, another important thing is we've talked a lot about um, the priority. A lot of those values I was talking about, like access class and ARP and all of that, you know, those are like static priority level uh, parameters that are sitting there. But what if you have like a chemical, say, say like in, in, in a Grand Junction, you have a chemical spill at the street corner. You know, do you necessarily want police and fire having the highest uh, uh, priority for that response? Or maybe hazmat should have it. So there should be a capability of what they call local control. If a local event happens, the local people, probably this would be run at the PSAP, I would imagine, have the ability to go through a portal into the into the FirstNet core network and dynamically change some priority values for a certain temporary incident and then have the ability to change them back once that incident's over. Because again, the technology's there. The hard part is figuring out the policy of who gets what priority for what use case, right? That's that's the that's the difficult part. Kim, has, uh, has the state uh, defined, I, I think it's still the case where the states define what what public safety is for their state. Um, I know that, you know, police, fire, EMS is obviously public safety, but many states are talking about <coughs> pop utilities on there, right. transportation. It's kind of secondary users. Yeah. Yeah. So we responded in two public notices through the Federal Register to FirstNet. That's the way you engage with FirstNet in terms of giving them official feedback. 
And we told them both times that we believe it should be determined at the local level, that a public safety entity is their calling, someone who's gonna access the network outside of the general public, but any agency that might use it for public safety response or recovery um, would be determined by your agencies um, ahead of time. And then hopefully the ability dynamically to manage that at some point in the future that's why we've come out to all of the counties and said to you, tell us who your agencies are so we can ensure that we're collecting data for them as a potential user on the network as well. We, um, you see most states are pretty broad in their interpretation. Really the only um, entity that's pretty narrow other than the commercial carriers is APCO, which is kind of interesting. APCO has said, no, it should be police, fire, EMS only. And most of the states say we don't actually agree with that interpretation, so. so as it relates to this, you may have, uh, like you, you mentioned, hazmat. You may have like utility users that you consider part of the public safety group that has a device that you may give them priority access over your typical public safety users, depending on the event. But right. You give the identity management piece. I think I'm saying it right. Gives you the ability to to manage at that level who gets access to to the network. And yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, because utilities. Um, I guess it's still kind of up for debate. They're kind of considered kind of secondary kind of users, but a lot of utilities I talk to in the state say, you know, we're the priority. We need to get power back up. You know, we we need to get our stuff done before anyone else can do what they're doing. So right. if there's no power, then you know, police and fire and all that can't uh, can't respond. The other issue to change party could be if you have an, a big disaster and you've got first responders coming in from different uh, jurisdictions and you might want to increase their priority temporarily. So, you know, you need that ability to look to, from a local point of view, to tunnel into the subscriber databases and be able to dynamically change priority for a certain uh, uh, incident. And how that's managed dynamically in the future, we don't know yet. Yeah. You know, we'd like to think it be in some way, perhaps interfaced with your CAD system or a web EOC capability where it's not really related to somebody in and going in and pushing a button. And the networks operate too quickly for anything like that to be managed. But if you can geofence an incident on your CAD system and somehow that informs the knock and the network is managed that way, you know, that's kind of what the um, NIPSTIC, the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council, the folks helping FirstNet set priorities and requirements is envisioning. So. Yeah, and if you use a location Based services, and you can triangulate what users are there. Then you exactly. can send changing access class or certain parameters over the air. To them. That's kind of the catch term you're going to hear now going forward is location-based services. That's yeah. the way things yeah. are driving. So. Okay, uh, security authentication. Obviously, I mean, uh, there's ciphering on the over-the-air uh, interface and LTE between the uh, the UE SIM and the network to authenticate. Uh, some of the uh, some of the things to keep in mind. I mean, we talked about the um, you know, mobile VPNs and IPv4 versus IPv6. I mean, some of that's going to have to be figured out um, how, how you're going to work with that. The other other issue is lawful intercept. I mean, you know, where you're going to have lawful intercept at certain uh, uh, gateways. And what we'll talk about when you do direct mode and some users go off net outside of coverage and it's actually talking UE to UE, you know, if the, if the UE is off the network, how do you monitor what's going on with that? Then there's some people are working on that in standards, you know, whether they wait and they kind of upload or you bar certain users from actually uh, talking to the network when they get out of uh, out of coverage, especially this would be users that might not be directly, you know, law enforcement, but might be secondary users that you're uh, working with. Um, okay, I think we talked about a lot of this, so I'm going to just read that. Okay, so some of the functionality and standards we were talking about. So, I mean, there's been kind of somewhat related functionality, means self-optimizing networks, a lot of things that, you know, public safety will leverage, but Really, in release 11, one of the key ones they did was the typical transmit power for uh, an LTE phone is 23 dBm, so 200 milliwatts. So it's pretty low compared to like the LMR uh, devices. So what they did is they changed in the standards and they created a, a, and that's called Power Class 3. They created a Power Class 1 that goes up to 31 dBm for re Region 2 of the Americas. Uh, and that allows, and especially more rural areas when you get far, because in, in LTE, um, you're really limited by the, 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 the size of the coverage of the cell site based on the uplink. It's the ability of the UE to talk, the mobile device to talk back to the tower. And if you have a higher power mobile device, obviously you can extend the, uh, the range of that uh, UE. Now that could also lead to some more interference, but you know, we wouldn't anticipate that most users on the network would have high power UEs. It would certainly just be public safety uh, and they would be a small percentage of the users on the, on the network. So, 
Uh, that's certainly there. I don't know that there's yet any real devices commercially out there that, that have it yet. I know some RFPs have gone out and some responses, but I haven't, I haven't personally seen a, a power class one device yet. Um, but actually, that's not true because uh, at the PSCR conference in June, uh, when I was talking about PSCR, did that boomer site and they went out like a 115 kilometers, they had high power UEs for that. So yeah, they had some, so are, there are some devices out there now. Um, one of the next things of proximity services, this is the avail uh, availability of uh, UEs to talk to other UEs when either they're, they're not in coverage or the, um, the cell site's down, it's, it's lost its backhaul. So this is the ability for UEs to discover each other. Simplex mode each other. on LTE. Yeah. Yeah, if that helps, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just data, it's data, right? Uh, well, it should, uh, well, it, well it, it eventually, well, it's the discovery process is just like a data app. You mean, uh, Oh, but, uh, so we still can't do direct mode. Oh, no, 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 okay. So what I'm talking about is in standards. It's not actually out there on LTE networks right now. So you can see that the, the, this standard just got finished in March of 2015. So what I'm talking about now, sorry, this functionality, this is coming. This is what's being worked on in standards right now. So it's not, this they do have some devices out now, but the rest of what I'm going to talk about is not really out on LTE networks yet. But hopefully most of it should be by the time, uh, 2018 rolls around, but this is a typical type of functionality you're used to in LMR. So the proximity service is basically being able to find other devices, and there's commercial applications for this. You know, you want to find your friends. Where are they? And you can use the UE can go find where the other other UE is. Uh, so, so this discovery mechanism, it's always on, but doesn't drain the battery. Uh, you can do it per. You can identify them per UE basis or based on application. But the really important one is the direct mode. So this is the ability to talk between UEs, whether you're in coverage of the cell site or not. So if, if for example, this site's in, in the cell site coverage, but this isn't, this isn't, then it can talk through this UE to get back to the network. Now in release 12, they've worked on the ability to do this and the ability for UEs to talk to UEs, but you have to be in coverage. For, for UEs to talk to UEs outside of coverage, that's being pushed into the next release, which is which is release 13. Okay, the next is the group communications. So this is kind of like the one-to-many uh, talking to do uh, video, uh, push to talk, uh, data. This is going to be based on EMBMS, which is the uh, evolved uh, multi what's it, multi broadband, no, the multimedia broadband multi service. Um, so, so this is kind of like your multicast technology. So it's going to be so group communications. They were trying to decide what it was, how they were going to use this, and they're going to they're going to base it on EMBMS. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about the LMR to LTE interoperability that's being worked on by TIA and ADIS. A lot of the security issues, a lot of how you tie these networks together, how they're going to interoperate when you know the user equipment's defined differently. It's on different uh, framing scenarios. You know how how they're going to interoperate together. So release 13, as I was saying, they're going to continue to work on proximity services. This is relaying UE to UE and UE to network when you're outside of coverage. Uh, continue to work on group communications as well. The mission critical push to talk just started. Uh, so it just started last fall. They set up the, uh, the task group to work on it. So I don't think you're going to be seeing this for probably another couple of years. Uh, it's probably going to be pushed into release 14 as well. So we won't even see release 13, the kind of initial standards for mission critical push to talk until March 26. Uh, they have QCI values set for them, which we were showing earlier. So just, sorry, yeah. just to interrupt you. So from, especially in the fire world, where you're doing talk, in the mobile world term, I guess, talk around, going device to device, you're in a fire scene, you're talking out to the commander, or whoever's in charge, you're not using the network. You're basically going, you're using mission critical push to talk from one device to the other. That's still down the road. That's not going to be any any time near uh, near term as far as the rule. Right. Yeah. You might have direct mode to be able to talk to it, but it won't be mission critical push to talk. And then, and the other thing too is, you know, this 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 is going to have to be able to eventually interoperate with this. But this is this is going to come before before this does. So, I, I think it's important to point out that just because it's in the standard doesn't mean it is available to the end user. Yeah, so that, that's why I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah, it, it, I mean, we don't even know how reliable it's going to be. It's just basically being worked on in standards. So they're trying to figure out the interfaces, the architecture. They do know that there's going to be reference points to IMS. This is the IP multimedia subsystem. This is what's required to do uh, Volte and LTE. 
So they know that there's going to be some kind of reference point to that. There may be a mission critical push to talk application server or gateway that'll touch the, uh, the IMS network. Uh, but it's very much in the early stages. There's almost not really much to, much to talk about. So it could be, before you see products, it could be another five years or so. Um, the other thing they're looking at is uh, uh, ice, uh, isolated UTRAN operations means like this is basically an eNode B getting cut off from its backhaul or like working with uh, deployables. So a lot of that stuff I was talking about, deployables, how you're going to use this group talk, mission critical push to talk, all that in a deployable scenario that's all also being uh, worked on. And then they're also talking about mission critical video as well, but I, that's very much in the preliminary stages. So a lot of the public safety functioning you know, started in release 11, so it, they are starting to incorporate a lot more public safety uh, functionality into the LTE standards. But you know, it could be years away until we see a lot of uh, of this in products. And you know, how how expensive those products are going to be and all that, you know, still still TV. Um, I think I'm just going to let you. These are just some of the near term impacts. 5G is just something that's being Verizon thinks they might have something in 2017. AT&T saying, "Well, hold on, wait a minute, we got to get it figured out in standards before we do this." But it's basically making cell sites much more smaller, much more ubiquitous, much cheaper, which unfortunately means that you know you might not have as much functionality in these. One of the, we're, I'm working on a project at Department of Homeland Security with Science and Technology to go out to some, to figure out, okay, when we go to 5G and we've got very small cell sites operating from you know, 400 megahertz up to 90 gigahertz, and all these different, we have heterogeneous network now, now it's gonna be unbelievable. We have all types of different networks integrated together, different access technologies, integrated with fiber, different frequency bands. Uh, you know, if we make cell sites ubiquitous like this, then they're gonna be very cheap. Well, how do we get all this priority preemption and public safety and, and kind of a wireless party service uh, functionality into those very cheap sites? They're already starting to think about that because, you know, there could be, you know, fairly decent deployment of 5G networks by, you know, 20, 2019, 2020. So it's by the time maybe FirstNet's all done and then 5G is going to be coming right on the heels right. of that. To so. be clear, FirstNet has said in their RFP that their partner has to be prepared to deploy whatever is commercially available yeah. and um, going on in the commercial industry at the time when their network's deployed. So it's not like a situation where Land Mobile Radio where, you know, we were trying to get to Motorola's current version, they were a year or two years ahead of us. FirstNet does not intend to be in that predicament. They intend to, if 5G is what's available and what's being commercially deployed by their partner or partners, ideally they'd be deploying the network the same. So it'd be keeping lockstep with what's occurring in the public sector. Yeah. Or so private, really, private sector, I should say. Is it really 5G or is it like advanced 4G? <clears throat> They're just well. So you know, 4G really was is, wasn't 4G until about a year ago. So until they did uh, release 10 LTE advanced, they didn't meet the speeds called by uh, IMT first 4G. So it, it, it's really kind of a vision. And, high, and Verizon has put together kind of a 5G working group with like Qualcomm and Ericsson and some vendors, and they're starting to do some trials and testing in their lab in Waltham. So you know, it's it's getting to be a little bit more than just kind of a vision right now. They're going to start trialing to see what the vendors are capable of. But yeah, Kim brings up a good point is. We have the same thing in wireless priority services and we do these contracts with the carers and all that. We say, you know, you've got to keep up with the technology refresh. You've got to take our service and you've got to migrate it to whatever technology you're on. So the RFP is really objectives driven, you know, as opposed to real specific requirements. So it's really about that, keeping that service. So, um, okay, LTE network design. Um, okay, so this... This right here is, uh, I call it the Global Composite Total Population Density of Colorado. So everywhere you see dark blue, there's more than five people per square mile, not only based on census data, but also on geotag social data that's been collected the last five years. So the last five years, if there, there's been more people, if there's been more than five people per square mile out in these areas, it's been captured on this. So what you can really see is that, you know, the commercial carriers, they build for this area in here. And you know, Telluride and Grand Junction. You know, but there's all this area way out here in the Eastern Plains. There's all this area here on the Western Slope, and even in these areas here, where there there are people. So you know, there there could be a need for public safety. So one of the things I like to point out here is that you know, you may have a terrestrial network covering a lot of this, but probably in your negotiations with FirstNet, if you do determine you need coverage out in these areas, you know, there's going to be a lot of talk about deployables because it simply isn't cost effective to be able to put terrestrial sites uh, everywhere. So this is just to give you an idea of, of 
really truly how dispersed if you, if you if you made that threshold if we have to cover an area five people or more per square mile then you know this is this is what you're looking at um, you know maybe it's 10 people per square mile 20 you know it depends on what the what the threshold is but for an overall coverage objective just based on global population density you know this is this would be it if you made that threshold five people or more per square mile so I, I, I look at the social data for the Delta area. Sorry, you have in your handout Centennial. That's right, I did the presentation in March, but we'll send you an update. I wanted to do something a bit more local. So here's where we, we're like down here, I believe. Here? Um, oh, oh, okay, right. Oh, maybe this is it. Sorry, this is it. Yeah, that's the blue area there. So I, could, I, I did find it was interesting. Whatever's here, there's a lot of... Uh, Geotag social data. I don't know what's going on there, but most of the a lot of this is census. But you do see these areas in red, where you you've got a lot of areas. So you know you wouldn't be looking at, you know, just covering this area here. But this gives you a good idea of not only where the population lives and works, but where it's clustering in the area. So if you wanted to put together an overall coverage objective based on population density, you'd look at this, and then later once the network's built, or if you wanted to focus where your cell sites are located. Obviously, you want to look here, here, these areas, and here, because this is where you see more of the population in the, in the red and dark red. So, yeah, you've got to cover this whole area, but where would you want to optimally put sites? You want to put them where the public is most likely to be in a 24-hour period. So the priority would be on the, uh, on the red and yellow and green area. Uh, this is a little bit downtown Delta, just to give you a zoom in on it. Uh, here's some areas here. We're seeing a little bit more activity, but basically this whole area you want covered. I could only get one building to show up here. I think it was the Egyptian Theater or some uh, uh, place down on Main Street. But anyways, that's a zoom in of the global population density. I use this Burning Man as an example because if you look at Burning Man like a temporary event and you look at the geotag social data, there's, there's the Burning Man statue there. But you see these blue lines here. They're almost lining up with the dirt roads in Google Earth. But this is actually where the public is. I mean, the public is definitely in this area. And if you have this kind of social data included in your coverage objectives, you're not going to have to necessarily remember all these temporary events. They're going to be pulled into your overall coverage objective. Because if you look at census data, that's what it looks like. Nothing. Now, obviously, Burning Man's a big event in Nevada, so they're going to, they're going to be able to capture this. But I, I, I was looking for some things, and like, like Steamboat Springs had something. I was trying to find – so what I probably should have done was a census plot of Vail and then a geotag social data – well, a composite population density with social data for Vail as well, and you can see how much more intense the uh, the population gets during the ski season. And when you say social data, is that like Facebook? Right. So the, the, where this data comes from is it's like Instagram, Google Plus, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and what and the tool that I use. What they do is every month they just collect all this data and they aggregate it all, and it's basically just taking all these points where people have been and it's triangulating where are the most where are they intersecting with each other. So where are you all these people are going everywhere, but where are they tending to congregate, which you don't really get from census uh, grid. So if you had, you know, for example here, if say you were doing a small cell planning, you know, and you had this area this this area here you wanted to cover, well, you put the cell site here, well the pub, people really congregating here. So you probably want to put the cell site closer to there. You won't be able to see that unless you have social data. You just you'll just see a census grid. Okay, um, so other, other sources of data for coming up with your coverage objectives, obviously uh, crime data. So I look at these two uh, sites here. This is Denver City and County, Jefferson County. Uh, this is, this is for, for Denver City and County. This is the crime incident report data. I did it up until March. Uh, it's a little over five years. It's over 336,000 records. You can see the different crimes that were committed. Now, again, I don't have the data for, you know, was this Arapaho and Jefferson County over here. I just had it for this, so I could only do it for that. But instead of plotting all the points, what I usually do is I do a crime incident density, and I say, okay, there's one crime per square, uh, square mile, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, you know, 100,000, 100,000 per square mile. You can see, obviously, downtown Denver, we see most of the crime happening. And this is a zoo. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. For the crime analysts, this would be a hot spot. Map. Yeah, it's a heat map for crime, basically. But instead of showing all the points, which doesn't take, I take it into densities, and I say, okay, where where can you really see the heat map of where the crimes are most occurring? Um, and and you know, you used to be able to get this from your CAD data. I got it was in a big Excel Excel file that I took this from. 
Uh, and then downtown Denver, not to make Denver look like some, you know, crime-ridden place. I mean, most capitals are like this. Well, in fact, I, <laughs> well, I, I did one for Portland, which I thought was a really friendly town. And actually, first, I ended up using that one, I think, in their coverage objective sheet. They took our one we did for Portland. Um, but, uh, yeah, you can see where the, where the crime is most, uh, most occurring. Uh, and then this is, a, this is a, a geographic hazard map in terms of earthquakes. So this shows you, you know, if you want to take into geographic hazards, this is all of, so we're, we're over here somewhere. Um, you know, this area here, you know, you might want to be concerned with uh, earthquakes or other, you know, avalanches, uh, flooding. I have a friend in Littleton and he got flooded a couple of years ago really bad. You know, where, where these natural disasters have a chance of occurring and how close is it to the population? So what I'm trying to show you is a lot of the different data sources you can build coverage objectives from, you know, population, where people live and work, where do they congregate, where's the crime happening, where are the geographic hazards. And so what you end up doing is I took this from, this is a, a little diagram I did for the, uh, the book that I wrote on FirstNet, but it's kind of a conceptual thing. It won't look like this, but if you say you took a county or tribe here, you know, you figure most of your area will be population. So I did it by, you know, say less than or more than five people per square mile. Your crime incident data ought to fit in there, you know, your CAD data that I was showing you before. Let's say you have some crime areas, and for some reason, I don't know why I might go outside the population and include that. I didn't show the global hazards here, so I don't want to confuse it too much. But in your areas, you know, there may be areas where you don't have any population, you don't have crime data. I don't know here if you've got areas where there's things on people doing drugs, and they basically take you know, burner phones that don't have GPSs in them, they go out in the middle of nowhere, there's some deal going down. You're not going to see that with CAD data. You're not going to see it with social data. You're not going to see population. So this would be a good candidate here for someone to go into Google Earth and just draw like a little file, maybe it's a shape file, and you know, send it up to Kim and say, hey, got the population, got the crime, geographic hazards, jurisdictional data. Don't forget about this because this won't come up anywhere else. This is local knowledge that knows this. This is a special area of operations that we need coverage. That we've got LMR coverage and we don't we don't have any data coverage right now. Okay, um, so th this is kind of show you what it would look like. Now this is just crime and population, um, and again I don't have the data for the for the adjacent counties, but this is Denver City and County, and I said I think it was yeah it was, uh, anywhere where a crime's been committed more than 100 per square mile in the last five years. And then also where the population is greater than five people per square mile. So if I had the data for the adjoining counties, you know, you'd see that look a lot more like this, kind of sitting in the greater Denver Boulder area if you wanted to section it off that way. And this would give you a, a pretty decent start for a, for a coverage. But say, you know, you might have an area of operations here for some reason. Now, this is Air Force reservation, so that's why I don't see a lot of data there because it's probably blacked out from social data and use of phones and all that. But Anyways, maybe this might be a, a, a crime area where you might want to include that in the coverage objective. So, okay. Don't forget about your fire danger. Wildfires and things like that, you have to take that in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, any geographic hazards. I mean, you know, avalanches, floods, that sort of thing. Um, I'm not going to go through this. This is a uh, too much. Um, just real quickly, uh, to, to start determining, um, you know, what's the extent of your cell coverage, you usually do like a link budget. And what feeds into this is your operating parameters. You know, we know our operating band is the upper 700 megahertz. We know we're doing frequency division duplexes. We've got 10 meg up, 10 meg down. We've got specifications of the handsets. We know the channel bandwidth is 10 megahertz. Uh, we have OEM specific specifications. You know, what's the E node B transmit power, which is about 43 or 46 dBm. What's the antenna gain? What's the noise figure? What's the system overhead? You know, in terms of we've got a throughput, you know, of 50 megabits, but 25% of that's overhead. We need to make sure we include overhead. Uh, this I'll talk about in a minute is an original equipment manufacturer's link curve. Uh, usually you won't ever see this. This is very highly guarded secrets about how they map their modulation schemes and LTE to throughput based on the signal to interference to noise ratio. This all comes in, and, and, and what it gives you is your maximum allowable path loss. Does any LMR engineers understand what that is? That's basically from on the downlink from the tower down to the UE. What's the maximum amount of path loss you can take in dB? And then on the uplink, it's from the UE back to the tower. Usually, the maximum available path loss is going to be much bigger for the UE back to the tower, simply because the UE has a transmit power of 23 dBm or up to 31. The E node B has a transmit power of you know 40 you know, 20 db more than that 
43, 46 dBm. So really, your your link budget, how far your your cell coverage can go, is really going to be limited by the uplink, unless you have some incredibly aggressive downlink requirement, like six or eight megabits down, and you know 256 k up. It's most likely going to be limited by your your uplink, your UE up to the tower. Does that make sense conceptually? What what you get from that is your target coverage, your what's called your RSRP threshold, which I'll talk about in a minute. So when you see coverage and capacity plots, and because what you have is you've got a performance requirement, right? You say minimum in this area, I need one megabit down or 256k up, or three meg down, 256k up, whatever it is. But when when FirstNet or whoever does the design for you to get to, to give you that performance, they're going to have to figure out what the RSRP threshold is and what the required sign R is, and they'll usually do that for coverage as a cell edge requirement. So what's the what's the minimum uh, throughput at the cell edge, uplink and downlink? And so I need to know what my minimum sign R is, which is related to your downlink, and my minimum RSRP, which is related to your uplink. The, the, uh, the, this is signal to interference plus noise ratio. RSRP is a reference signal received power. And what they're most concerned about at the cell edge for you guys is you have to understand that in LMR you typically communicate and then you drop off the end of the earth and the communication is dead. But for uh, LTE and broadband, for you guys, it could be that the cell edge, you'll have the ability to text. You may not be doing getting to the internet, passing video, but at the cell edge you might have some capabilities. And so that's where understanding what those requirements are, that footprint and how the network design um, is so critical. Right, right. So if you if you want to be able to do video at the cell edge on the downlink, you know, you're going to need a couple megabits. If you just want to be able to receive texts and phone calls, you know, hundreds of kilobits per second is, is, is probably enough. So uh, just real quick, I'll say this is a 3GPP. This is a link curve. This is what I was talking about before. So this relates signal to noise uh, at a ratio to the different modulation and coding schemes in LTE. There's 29 of them. There's really kind of 28 effective ones. But what this shows you is that you need a better signal compared to your noise and interference to get higher modulation schemes. And the higher modulation schemes, which is like you go from QPSK up to 64 QAM, the higher the modulation scheme, the higher the throughput. So this, uh, th th this curve that the vendor has basically is going to link uh, and, and tell you what your, what your throughput's going to be. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, maybe I'll just mention this real quickly. I just wanted to show that the network capacity is really based on the quantity of the spectrum, which is 10 megahertz by 10 megahertz, the cell spectral efficiency, which is basically how many bits per hertz you can get out of each cell site, and the number of cells. So this is limited, and once you've exhausted this, you've got to increase the number of cell sites in a given area to increase the overall capacity. Uh, this is just showing, uh, this is Grant Park in Chicago. This shows where people are, this is a small cell design, but what it's basically showing you is the sites have been placed optimally where the public congregates. So you want to basically put the sites right where the people are for them to have the most impact. Okay, so you talked about this, uh, the fact that you're going to need a lot of infrastructure in Colorado and there's a lot of area to cover. Uh, you've got varied terrain, uh, you've got the Rocky Mountains, the Eastern Plains, and then you've got dense urban areas. Uh, one of the things you have to be careful about when you're in an area where it's very flat is seeing too many cell sites because you're constantly handing over and you're wasting RF resources. And if you've got many sites overlapping, that signal to interference plus noise ratio that I was talking about, that interference happens most at the cell boundaries. And you have something there called an interference fade margin, which is going to allow you to have some interference. But if you have too many sites, overlapping, you'll get a lot of interference, and you'll be ping-ponging around and handing off too much, which is once you start doing multi designs, you can really start taxing the control channels in, a, in multi by doing that. Another issue is a near-far problem. If you don't have a very good RF design and you can't play sites exactly where they're needed, you might have a site, you might have a user that's looking at a site way far away when they really should be looking at one closer in. So. Uh, terrain becomes a very big issue as, as you go out in these wide, expansive areas in, in Colorado. You get terrain, and you can also get terrain shadowing, where you actually you may have this might be your only cell site. You might have a cruiser here, and there might be a terrain bump here you haven't accounted for, and you'll lose coverage there. So the point is that there's a lot of RF. You're going to see every RF possibility in Colorado. Um, 
Oh, there it is. I knew I had that wildfire chart. There it is right there. Um, okay, so a, a lot of uh, uh, geographic hazards in Colorado. So to do, uh, so for these, these designs that I'm going to show you, I, I created a link budget. And what I basically said, the, the real important things are is the cell edge. I'm assuming that on the downlink, you're going to get at least 3 megabits per second. On the uplink, at least 256K. Um, I'm assuming a power class 3, so a normal device that you would get now, not necessarily a high power device. I won't get into MIMO, but multiple input, multiple output is kind of stacking different antenna processing systems to give you spatial diversity. So you can actually send different data on different spatial paths to the UE, so it gives you a little bit of a, a bump with uh, uh, transmit diversity. Um, but the point is, I made up my own link curve, so that link curve I was showing you before, I kind of made one up to go along with these data rates, and what I calculated from that is we need a signal to interference plus noise ratio greater than negative 1 dB, and an uh, RSRP greater than negative 113 dBm. Now that's to guarantee you this. Now as Kim was saying, most RSRP values on the UE is set to negative 120 dBm. So you can access the network, but you may be able to access the network, but you're not going to get these data rates. So that's the key. I need to, RSRP is really used a lot for, by the handset for cell selection, cell reselection, and cell handover. And you can go down to negative 125 dBm and still access the network. But what I'm saying is you need this level to be able to get this 256K on the uplink. And same thing with the SINAR, which is really related to downlink. You need to do better than negative 1 dB to get more than 3 megabits. Okay, so I'm going to go through this. This is the antenna I chose. I chose an antenna that was more for coverage than necessarily capacity. Uh, we did three different counties. So one of the urban ones we did was Jefferson County, just west of Denver. Uh, we were given 371 sites. Uh, 371 sites we considered in the analysis by Colorado. We picked uh, the best 27 to provide the coverage. So what this is, is this is... This is the downlink sign -out. This is a signal to interference to noise ratio. So remember, we need to be above negative one. So what this is basically saying is that with these 27 sites, and this is just based on area. So these statistics I'm pulling are not based on any kind of traffic weighting. Okay, I'm not looking at population. I'm saying these 27 sites are blasting coverage out everywhere. And you're in this area, you're guaranteed on the downlink as long as you're in this area where it's negative one dB or greater. Of getting three megabits on your on your downlink, and what this is what this mean? It's not a Gaussian distribution, so you have to look at the median, not the average. But what it's basically telling you is around eight dB, you're sitting at 50 percent. So if you're anywhere in this coverage area in Jefferson County, which I think covered about ninety percent of the area, uh, it just didn't cover this this area down here. Uh, you're guaranteed guaranteed of getting a signal to interference plus noise ratio of eight dB or better. Uh, which if you w went and looked on a link curve, that might be something like 10 or, or uh, 11 megabits per second. So SINAR is very important for the downlink. RSRP is very important for the uplink. So you can see here, anywhere you're blue, gray, you're down to negative 120. So if you're sitting here, you can still access the network. So if, if you go pull metrics off at your switch or from all your base stations, you'll see people doing uplinks here, but they won't be able to do it at 256 kilobits per second at rate. So this is looking at the uplink. Okay, so this is what you ultimately care about. So this is the throughput. So here's our 3 meg, and it goes up to about 33 meg. You can see that most of it, you're sitting at about 7.5 uh, dB. This is, a, this is a weighted signer, so this is taking into account the, uh, the, the user population. But basically, anywhere you see this coverage, you're going to be getting 3 megabits per second or better in your download. And I want to make one thing clear that here's a sector here. This is a snapshot in time of one millisecond. So in LTE, they have a time transmission interval that works off one millisecond. So a snapshot in time would show if I'm one user in this sector and I'm sitting way out here, I'm one user on that sector and I'm getting a download of three megabits per second, I'm taking up all the resources of that sector. No one else can get any resources. So if I'm a high priority user, like I have a, um, high access class or I've got an ARP level of like one or two and I'm and I'm trying to stream video to where I am, I'm like a police chief, I'm going to take all the resources in that sector. Now if I'm closer into the sector, then I can get up to 25, 18 megabits per second and if I'm very close under the sector, I might be able to get 33. But you can see your throughput changes as you move away from the cell site. And that's, and when we do this, 
this downlink and uplink thresholds, that's, you know, what's the minimum one user will get at the cell edge. So you could have one user getting three megabits per second or three simultaneous users getting one megabit per second. Uh, just to zoom in on to showing 3D what the coverage looks like. Uh, now I, so now I'm showing you the population density and I'm showing you how we have to design for capacity. So I won't go into it too much, but what I'm trying to, so before when I was showing you that, that might be a design for public safety and you're not sharing that spectrum with anyone. But if you have a, if you have a spectrum sharing arrangement, your partner might say, well, I have a need for, you know, uh, much more throughput, 96 times three times throughput times 3,600 is my busy hour traffic. I want this network to be able to offer up. So the point is you're gonna need many more sites. Now you see your SINAR, your median SINAR went down. It was like uh, 6.5 before. Well, the SINAR went down because you've got more sites, so you've got more sites crammed together, so you've got more potential for interference. But overall, you're offering more capacity up to the users in that coverage area, and you need more sites to do that. So this is a SINAR that's weighted for traffic. So you're actually taking the population into account, and it's actually trying to force the placement of sites where the population is, and you see where that population is dead, so you've got sites crammed a lot more tightly. Still meeting that three megabits down in 256K up. Okay, and this is area, now this is areas where the SINAR and RSRP weren't satisfied. So you do have some coverage holes there that you might have to put some small cells in. Um, and so I should say you might not have to do that. This is a high level design. Uh, if I was to do this design in the real world, I would look at different antenna center lines, different antenna types and optimize the <coughs> design. So it's a high level delay. I could probably optimize it and not have to add additional sites to that. And can I just qualify yeah, real quickly? Sure. Where he got these sites from was all of the data gathering to this during the state broadband initiative program. So we went and looked at what, what are called community anchor institutions. There's about 6,000 across the state. Your libraries, your hospitals, your um, your fire stations, your police stations, your county, your municipal buildings, and those were what Rob based off of. The other reason why we're interested in seeing what that design looks like um, is because FirstNet has said they're going to largely deploy in a carrier's footprint to start, and we have an alternative option to determine if that FirstNet plan is in Colorado's best interest, and if we de decide it's not, we would largely have to look at public assets as a way to deploy an alternative network. And so that's the other reason why we wanted to do some modeling. Um, you know, Rob did it. We're also doing some alternative efforts. Some of you guys have begun to see the uh, fruits of that effort. So that gives you a context for kind of where it's coming from. Okay, so, thanks, yeah. yeah. Um, so we did uh, another county, San Miguel. I think you're- two books from yep. San Miguel. Uh, so uh, uh, we had 84 sites. A lot of them were kind of clustered together in different areas, obviously around Telluride, some other areas. So what we ended up picking was, if we looked at those existing sites, we used uh, six of them, and this was the coverage that we got um, with the throughput. Now, if we wanted to cover, so eight site, six sites will cover most of where the population is, but you're not covering a very big geography of San Miguel. You're covering at 48%. So we said, okay, uh, let's look at the population density. We see the population density here. And obviously, there's people scattered all over because people are doing outdoor activities all over this county. Um, you go into Telluride, you know, this stuff will show up on census data, but you can even see the people going up on the ski slopes and everything, where, where they're actually moving. So, you, you know, a coverage hole here, you know, a skiing accident could be a, could be a problem. And these are not roads that I've drawn here. This is actually coming from social data. It's actually people on those roads that I'm collecting that actually are forming the picture of that road. It's not the actual road that I've drawn there. Um, okay. So what we said was uh, we, we increased it about up, up to 11 sites, but I wanted to get to the point where we, uh, add, so we're using existing sites, but I wanted to get to the point where we're adding sites. So say you wanted to increase, you, that, say that this coverage was fine if you were just covering the, uh, for a commercial user or covering public safety in populated areas. But say you wanted to go to an area to where, you know, you're seeing all of these type of people out in the middle of nowhere that we need, we need to provide, if you determine you need to provide coverage for them, you know, what do we do? Well, the good thing about this tool I like is it actually won't place a site anywhere unless it's within 20 meters of a road. So it won't just randomly place sites in the middle of nowhere. It'll actually place them where you can actually get to a site or potentially build a site. So what we came to, and this is, this is a, a bit of a high level design, is we, we took uh, 20, we had to take uh, 15 new sites 
So we got up to 21 sites to, to, to uh, determine, to get the coverage up to a level of over 90%. So, you know, if you wanted to cover 91% of San Miguel, you know, this is what you would do. Now, one thing I want to point out, I've got three sectored sites in a lot of these areas where you could, probably could do omnis. So I'm kind of making an assumption that you might have to build a site with some spectrum sharing agreement with someone who, I don't know, maybe they're, they're, they're into outdoors activities and they want to they touch people that are doing stuff outdoors. But that's the kind of site count you would look at for this. And, and uh, if you have questions, I'm going through this quick. If you have questions, you know, just if you want to email Kim and pass them to me, that's, that's fine. Um, Yuma County is very flat out on the Eastern Plains. We ended up looking at six sites. Six sites pretty much nailed it because it's so flat there. There's just really nothing to ob obstruct it. So we got about 98% geographic coverage meeting these throughputs. Uh, a couple things to remember is that you know we haven't verified these assets um, in terms of you know are they suitable to actually mount equipment? Um, you know some of them. Or backhaul. We have no sorry. Idea yeah, there's no analysis of power right. backhauls. All this is. So when I was Wild talking about yeah, all those sites, about all the things you look at when you look at a site like power, wind loading, all that, is just RF. It's all from an RF point of view. So you would not take this and go build a network off of this. This would be your first cut at it. Um, and, and the tool I use, actually, you can do line of sight backhaul, and it'll see, tell you how close you are to fiber and so forth. But you have to look at the uh, backhaul and constructability of, of the sites. And it's not completely optimized. Uh, we could have used 3D building data and tighter terrain bins down to a meter. I can even go down to 10 centimeters, which at 763 megahertz on the downlink, if you divide that out from the speed of light, the wavelength at which you start interacting with the environment is 10, is 40 centimeters. So, you know, any the, the, the smaller you go in terrain bin size, the less quantization error you have, because you're taking a continuous analog waveform and you're trying to put it into discrete bins. And the tighter you make those bins, the tighter the terrain bins, the better the clutter database, the better the resolution, and the more you get to actually predicting the true RF environment, which you know, I haven't gone to that level here. The other thing is we haven't optimized the design for different antenna patterns and, um, and load distribution among the sites. So it's a high-level design. It gives it trying to provide you the concepts and high-level things to look at you know, when you start seeing state plan. I guess you'll have people that will be reviewing the state plans if you guys are providing input from from FirstNet, so. And we're actually in the process now. We did the first pass to kind of share with all of you what FirstNet is. Um, we've been working with a, a consultant to begin, help us with coverage objectives. And so the next pass, like when you asked when we are coming out, um, and we'll be out to the other counties too over the um, falls into the spring, is to sit down and have those deeper level coverage objective discussions with you. Like uh, in San Miguel County, six sites maybe, but where could it be deployables? Where do you need fixed assets that we haven't come up with in an initial coverage pass? If that helps you to understand kind of what the process is gonna be ongoing. So. you have any questions from the uh, bridge? <laughs> there are some people still on there. So. They're just unconscious, <laughs> they passed out. Um, you want to, any, sorry, uh, any, any other questions or anything? Or was this, you know, if there's anything we didn't cover, you know, feel free to send us, you know. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good point. Um, I, I, it might have been on one of the slides, but I didn't call it out. Yeah. So when you do the initial link budget and you're trying to figure out your cell edge uplink and downlink, the assumption you kind of make is that that one sector that you're looking at is 100% loaded, but the adjacent cell sites are 50% loaded, and that's how you come up with the loading because the loading is intimately related to the interference fade margin, and the interference fade margin at the cell edge is basically the difference between your target sinar, which for us was like negative one dB, and what your sign R actually is. Uh, and so loading is very important. So you brought up a very good stat. It might have been on one of the slides, I forget to mention it. Typically, you don't want to uh, assume a loading on an LTE site of greater than 50%. Uh, certainly, if you start going up above that, you start having a very hard time with interference between adjacent cells and between sectors. Because as I was saying earlier, you're using the same frequency and time resource at the same time. And the, the LTE uh, 10 megahertz is really made up of subcarriers, and there's uh, uh, 600 of them. And 
you can't use up all those subcarriers at the cell edge. If you load up a cell site 100%, you're basically going to have a lot of interference and very bad sinar, which means very bad throughput in between the sectors inside the cell and between adjacent cells. So thank you for bringing that up. It's very important. Load is intimately related to interference margin, which is intimately related to what sinar you're going to get at the cell edge, and that's where your sinar is the worst. And so recommend 50% loading when you do uh, do an analysis. And that's why it's so important to have these priority mechanisms because you can't control the loading at a site if the site goes into 1x, 10x, 20x overload you're going to need those priority mechanisms to keep the public from overloading the site and make sure that public safety gets through. Uh, but there's also another analysis you can do where you can simulate an event and you can see what would happen with your SINAR, which is assumed to be 50, with a loading of 50% on these sites, what happens if you start going up above that 80% between adjacent sites. And what you'll see is the throughput starts really shrinking at the cell edge and you're essentially bringing in, the, bringing in that uh, capacity coverage much closer into the cell because you're getting so much interference towards the cell edge in between sectors and in between sites. Yeah, exactly right. Very good point. There was one question online about what is TT1? Did you? Oh, that's time transmission interval. Sorry, that's uh, TTI is one millisecond. Um, the the LTE is is based off of um, resource blocks, and resource blocks are. Uh, half of a millisecond, but they usually schedule them as one millisecond. So you can think of LTE, the scheduler in LTE, which is combining the frequency and time resources to give you the, the modulation scheme for the throughput you need is it's kind of working on a time transmission interval of one millisecond. So those plots that I'm showing you is, is basically a snapshot inside that time transmission interval of what the coverage and capacity uh, could be expected to look like. How many uh, how many users does an average commercial carrier have associated with the sector at a time to give people an idea? Of the number of it's, it, it can be hundreds to thousands. So you know the, the the key. So if you look at like Volte, like a lot of the, like a ten megahertz channel, a lot of the analysis that's been done with Volte is going to show you about. And it depends on the vocoder in your phone. You've got adaptive multi-rate wideband and adaptive multi-rate. They can go from like. 6.6 .6 kilobits per second. I think it's 23.85 kilobits per second. So it depends on the phone you have, but you're looking at hundreds of users on a sector usually for 10 megahertz. You know, maybe two to 400, uh, and it's uplink limited. So you know, you could serve them in one direction, downlink more, but it's really uplink limited on Volte. But so you can do hundreds of, of users, but you can have thousands of users attached to the site. The key is that users are in different states. That default bear that I was talking about, once you're attached to the network, you've got an IP address with that network, you're attached to it, you just might not be doing anything. So you could have thousands of users attached to a sector, but a lot of them are idle. Hundreds of them could be active, but maybe only tens of them could be active simultaneously. So it's it's hard to say, but you know, you're looking at for most data applications serving, you know, hundreds of users in a sector. Could be thousands for lower, and it could be you know two or three if they're doing you know HD video. So. And then you've got three sectors per site as well. Yeah. And those operate independently. Right. So, just to give you an idea, very different from my memory. Any other questions? Thanks very much for having us. I want to thank Rob. Rob is probably the most talented engineer I've ever been on the LTE side. He's <laughs> <laughs> a non-engineer, so he shouldn't. He could just be blowing smoke, but I assume he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> but he's he's really talented. And if you have questions on the technical side, uh, throw them to Ken. I'm sure she'll get into one. If you have the more general operational questions, I'm happy to respond to those uh, from the public safety side. But we do appreciate you having us. Thanks, Ken, for having us. Uh, there are. Uh, I think about 10 to 15 extra books if you want to take a quick dip. Yeah. Or anybody wants them? Thank you. All right. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. 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 Thank Yvonne from California says, thanks, good job. Oh, okay. Um, oh, you might already. No, that's fine. Sorry, sound bad.